Oh, that's connected to my computer, so it's. Oh, no. it's, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's, well, it's okay. I can just use this. So, the plan of my talk will be as follows. First, I will talk about the Knapp Stein intertwining operators and uh, some role that they can play in conformal field theories. And then uh, I will discuss how we can use these tools, the Knapp Stein intertwiners, to study the question of NLTC and spin in conformal field theory. And that will probably, these two topics will eat up most of the time. And if we have time in the end, then we will use this formalism to study operator product expansion of some non local operators. And this, uh, this talk is based on uh, the first two parts are based on the paper that we published this summer with David Simmons Deffen. And the last part is based on work in progress with David Simmons Deffen, Sasha Jabayedov, and Murat Kalogu. And Murat is a graduate student at Caltech. Now, so the simplest example of uh, Knapstein intertwining operator is the so called shadow transform, which is, of course, well known. And I will denote it by the symbol S delta. So we can apply shadow transform to functions of x. Uh, here, for simplicity, we look at the scalar function. And the transform is given by this expression where uh, delta is some parameter. And we use here a delta tiled, which is d minus delta. And d is the dimension of space. And uh, for now, we are working in Euclidean signature. So the importance of this transform comes from the fact that if we assume that phi transforms as a scalar, pr scalar primary operator of dimension delta, then this transform is conformally invariant. And it, is, uh, it produces an object which transforms as a scalar function with dimension delta tiled, which is equal to d minus delta. And to see this, it's convenient to write this integral in a slightly different form, where we simply recognize that this kernel here is nothing but the conformally invariant two-point function of a scalar primary with dimension uh, delta tiled. And to see that the integral is conformally invariant, we simply count the dimension at point y. So we have phi of y, which has dimension delta. We have phi tiled, which has dimension delta tiled. Their dimensions add up to delta. And this dimension delta cancels the dimension of the integration measure, giving us a conformally invariant integral. Um, now, this transform radially straightforwardly generalizes this to operators with spin, where we simply replace the two point function with the appropriate two point function of operators with spin, and we can track the indices. Now, to describe the representations in which, uh, so I, I just said operators, so in, in, in practice, uh, we can apply this to any functions, which we assume to transform under conformal group in a certain way, and I will sometimes call them operators because in the end, this will be operators, primary operators in conformal field theory. So describe the, to describe the transformation properties of such operators, it is convenient to use this notation, which I will now explain. So usually we parameterize operators by scale and dimension delta and some uh, representation of the rotation group SOD. So the representation of rotation group can be uh, specified by highest weight vector. And here I'm just splitting this highest weight vector into two, num into two parts, a number j and the vector lambda, uh, and a weight lambda. So we can think about lambda as a weight for SOD minus 2. And the splitting is uh, such that for trace systematic operators, we will have lambda equals 0. Now the way to formulate this is that we simply describe our operators by Young diagrams. And j is the length of the first row of the Young diagram, and all the other rows go into lambda. So in terms of these weights, so yes, an important point is that this triple can be interpreted as a weight of the algebra SOD plus 2, which is the, com which is the complexified form of the conformal algebra. So what shadow transform does to these quantum numbers is that it takes delta j lambda and sends it to this combination. So delta goes to d minus delta. And there is some reflection which is applied to lambda, which essentially exchanges left and right-handed spinners in, in even dimensions. So do not pay too much attention to this r. And the question that I want, uh, yes. And uh, since I said that the shadow transform is conformally invariant, it commutes with all the conformal generators. In particular, it also commutes with the conformal casimirs. 
which means that it should preserve the eigenvalues of these casimirs as, as these casimirs act on the our primary operators. And for example, the eigenvalues of the quadratic and quartic casimirs for the case of lambda equals zero are given by these expressions in terms of delta and j. And you can indeed, we can indeed check that this map preserves these eigenvalues. So there is no problem with this. And uh, the question that I want to ask is, are there any other conformally invariant integral transforms which we can apply to primary operators and get new other new primary operators out of them, um, which is similar to shadow transform but are different? And we can try to answer this question by asking what other transformations can we apply to these weights in a way to preserve in a way which preserves the eigenvalues of conformal Casimirs. To answer this question, it's useful to, there is a useful theorem which says that all the weights which have the same Casimir eigenvalues as delta j lambda can be obtained from delta j lambda by applying the, uh, by acting with the affine action of the while group on the original weight. So the while group is some, for, for any particular dimension, the while group is some particular finite group and we can just go through the list of all the elements in this group and write the corresponding transformations. So for example, there are, are also transformations of this form. The first one, let's say, takes, uh, doesn't change delta and lambda essentially and just changes j by sending to two minus d minus j. And if you go back to these expressions, you can check that, again, this expression is invariant under this transformation. There, of course, are more interesting reflections. For example, there are reflections which swap delta and j. And you again can check that all the Casimirs are invariant. And there are many more, and the number depends also on space-time dimension. And some of them include the reflections which will mix components of lambda with delta and j. We'll swap uh, components of lambda with delta or j and so on. Or there is, it turns out that, so you can ask whether there exist uh, conformal invariant integral transforms which uh, apply these transformations. And it turns out that the answer is no. And the reason for this is that all these reflections have a subtle problem. And the origin of this problem is that to, in order to make sense of this uh, weight as a something which parameterizes a primary operator, we want the pair J lambda to be a dominant weight for the SOD group in order for, for it to define a fine dimensional representation. And this in particular requires, for example, that J be a non-negative integer or half integer. So this immediately leads, leads to a problem with first reflections. It's, since for a negative j in dimensions greater than two, it will send j to a negative number. So it doesn't preserve the property of the SOD weight being dominant. And the second reflection has a problem that since delta in general, the scaling dimension in general can be some complex number for generic delta, after this reflection, the new j is not even an integer. So, and it turns out that all the reflections in this list, uh, all the reflections in the while group, except the one which corresponds to shadow transform, fail this property and we can only use shadow transform. However, I should mention as a side comment that for certain cases when delta is, say, is a neg negative half integer, your reflections like this can be fine. And in that case, we find uh, that there are sometimes conformally invariant differential operators between the weights, and this has been discussed in Vladimir Dobrev's talk on Wednesday. So uh, we have just seen that there is only one good reflection in the while group for, uh, for the Euclidean conformal group. And these uh, good reflections which preserve the property of the weight being dominant form some subgroup of the while group, which I'll call the restricted while group. And in the Euclidean conformal group case, it's, as you've seen, is Z2 and uh, there is nothing much we can do. But as it turns out, if we go to Lorenzian signature, then we replace the rotation group by the Lorenz group. And for Lorenz group, we can, make a, we can actually make sense of uh, label J being a general complex number in the, precisely the same way as we make sense of, lab, of label delta and being a complex number for the Euclidean conformal group because Euclidean conformal group is nothing but uh, Lorenz group in D plus two dimensions. So if you go back to this list of reflections, for example, the, f the second one and also the first one are now fine because they preserve 
the dominance of lambda because they don't change it, but they change j in some some way. You know, but it's okay now because j can be any complex number. So it turns out that if we now look through those of these reflections again, we will find that in Lorenzian signature, the restricted wild group is larger and is a dihedral group of order eight. And then uh, Knapp and Stein studied this question in more ge general context, and they found that for every element of uh, a fine uh, of this uh, restricted wild group, there exists an integral transform for which they gave an explicit formula. And so we can ask what do this uh, Knapp-Stein integral transforms mean for us in the conformal field theory in Lorentzian signature. But to answer this question, as I said, we need to make sense of comp complex spin. And so let us do this first. And to define complex spin, the step zero is to understand, uh, set up our conventions for integer spin. And so for simplicity, we'll focus only on uh, trace symmetric operators, which have j indices, mu1 through mu j. They are symmetric and traceless in this indices. And it's uh, convenient, which is often done in uh, the literature on conformal field theory, to encode these operators by introducing polarization vector z, contracting all the indices of O with uh, this polarization vector z. And uh, since the, it suffices to use only one polarization vector because the operator is symmetric and because the operator is traceless, we can also restrict this vector to be null. And uh, for example, if you set parameterize this null vector in the following form in terms <coughs> of two variables z and z bar, then this requires the parameterization that Vladimir Dobrev used in his talk on Wednesday uh, in four dimensions. So by construction, this function of polarizations of xz, it is defined on the forward null cone z squared equals zero. It's homogeneous in z with a certain degree, which is, which is spin, just equal to spin. And the last requirement is that the last property is that it's actually a polynomial in z. So if you have such a function, then we can extract from it, get, get the <coughs> tensor from which we started back by using by repeated application of a differential operator, which we nowadays call Todorov operator. And uh, so our goal is to generalize this definition to complex spin j. And we see that the only problem with doing the generalization, so we could set here j to be any complex number. The only problem is that for complex j, we will not be able to require that the function is a polynomial, so we'll simply drop this requirement. And our definition of continuous spin operator will be simply a function of two variables, x and z, for complex j. Uh, it's a function of forward null cone, which is homogeneous in this uh, light cone coordinate uh, null, cone, null cone vector with degree j. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, a standard construction which comes out from representation theory of uh, and construction, standard construction of representations. And so it's not like any invention, it's just uh, the way to describe this uh, representations in the way which is closest to the way, to, to how we usually describe integer spin operators. And now if we, uh, uh, now, now that we have this formalism for continuous spin operators, we can finally write down some new integral transforms and the integral transform, which will be the most important in this talk, has this form. So it will denote it by letter L. It will, I will sometimes call it light transform. And it has the following definition. So if you want to evaluate the integral transform of a primary operator at point x with polarization vector z, what we do is we compute certain integral where the polarization vector of the operator is kept unchanged, but the position of the operator is shifted along uh, the polarization vector by some amount which depends on the integration variable alpha and then integrate over alpha with a certain weight. So to encode this definition a little bit, let me show you a picture. So as uh, Lucia and Mac taught us, we should be thinking about our uh, conformal field theory as living on the Minkowski cylinder. So here you have Minkowski cylinder and the usual Minkowski space is a a uh, particular subregion, which is space like separated from the point at infinity. And if you look at this integral, let's say we want to compute, uh, we take some point x, and we want to compute this integral transform at 
inserted at this point. Then this in integral instructs us at alpha equals minus infinity at the lower limit of integration to start with our original primary operator at point x because this is zero. And then as alpha increases, th this point starts moving in the direction of z. So here it will look like that we are moving in some null direction, which is just given by polarization vector z. Now as alpha reaches zero, this in our integration contour reaches future null infinity of the Poincaré patch. And the prescription is then, as alpha crosses zero, to go into the next Poincaré patch in, in Koski cylinder. And, uh, well, I'm not drawing this properly, but it's supposed to go around the cylinder and add the integration contour ends at the image of point x in the next Poincaré patch in the cylinder. This is a point at which all the null rays starting from point x intersect on the cylinder. And so, in particular, it's clear from this picture that there is nothing special about point alpha equals zero. It's just, it is just an artifact of our coordinates. And so, as it turns out, in correlation functions, there is no need to define how this integral behaves near alpha equals zero. The fact that it's, there is seeming diver, diver, divergence at alpha equals zero is just an artifact of our coordinate system. So uh, if we just apply dimensional analysis to this integral, we see that, for example, delta, the scaling dimension of the, of the result, is equal to 1 minus spin. To see this, we simply see that uh, for this expression to make sense, alpha has to have mass dimension 1. So this factor has the mass dimension 1 minus delta minus j multiplied by operator over dimension delta, you get 1 minus j. And a similar argument can be ran for the homogeneity properties in Z. And we see that this integral transform implements this particular reflection, which was shown in three slides before. So the, the reason why this integral transform is particularly important among all other transforms is that one can show that they, it converges in correlation functions for uh, if delta plus j is greater than one. And now this condition is satisfied in mo for most pr pr uh, local operators in uh, a unitary safety, in fact, in dimensions uh, greater or equal to four, it's satisfied, it is satisfied for all uh, local operators in unitary safety. So this transform produces for us a lot of interesting examples of uh, non-integer spin operators. And in fact, we are very familiar with one such example. If we take light transform, so if you take light transform of stress tensor, so L of T, and we insert uh, and we set x to be uh, at past null infinity. So we set, so this is the Penrose diagram for our Minkowski space. So we insert L of t at past null infinity. Then our integral starts at past null infinity, goes through the Minkowski space, and that ends at future null infinity. And if you figure out what happens to various uh, weight factors and so on, as you send the point to my past null infinity, you find this expression. And if you take z to be along the minus direction, then you simply find that this integral transform gives you the average null energy operator. So for example, this uh, tells us that average null energy operator can be interpreted as a primary operator of uh, spin one minus d inserted at past null infinity. And let's say, the conformally covariant statement of average null energy condition is that this operator inserted at any point with any polarization is greater or equal to zero, is non negative. So, for example, uh, in this conformal collider setup of Hoffman and Lucena, the this uh, operator is inserted at spatial infinity, so this line is pushed up, so that the operator is inserted here and the integration goes around future null infinity and has the interpretation of an energy detector inserted somewhere in celestial sphere. But as I said, uh, there are many other reflections which we can define. And uh, uh, I promise to fool the hydro group of order eight. So if we, in addition to the slide transform, I'll define also the transform SJ of O, which just takes uh, particular applies a particular integral transform to the polarization vector. So this is supposed to be z prime, uh, and 
does nothing to the coordinates, then by just examining this expression, we see that it has some ingenuity degree 2 minus d minus j in variable z. And so it implements this reflection, which sends uh, j to 2 minus d minus j. And then together, these two uh, transforms, L and S, generate the, whole, the full dihedral group, which has this list of elements. They have various orders, and uh, they apply various reflections to the quantum numbers. So uh, if we, for example, apply, plug in the quantum numbers of stress tensor in this table, so we said delta equals d, uh, j equals 2, and lambda equals 0, then uh, also we have to ask which integral transforms actually converge for this quantum number. So we find that there are two convergent integral transforms, the light transform, which we have discussed, and which gives the average energy operator, and also another transform, which is a combination of light transform with this as j, which gives something interesting. It produces an operator of spin 1 with dimension minus 1. So just out of curiosity, we can ask what is, what is the meaning of this transform. So if we apply this R to T, we find some function omega of x and z. And uh, by construction, it has to be dim dimension minus 1, spin 1 operator. And since we're working with continuous spin operators, we have dropped the requirement that things are polynomial polarization vectors. And it's not obvious whether, uh, whether, we, whether we can factor out z mu out f from, uh, from w of x z. But if you just examine the definition of R, you find that this is true. So this omega of x z is actually a usual vector integer spin operator. And furthermore, it has the correct scaling dimension to satisfy a conformal Killing equation. So we can uh, plug it in the conformal Killing equation, use the conservation condition for stress tensor, and find that indeed the conformal Killing equation is satisfied. And uh, since the conformal Killing equation has finite domain solutions, we can expand uh, this transform in a basis of the solutions. So the basis elements are omega AB, where AB are some indices and there are some expansion coefficients LAB. And as is well known, the solutions to conformal Killing equation transform under, uh, in a joint representation under conformal group, and so do the coefficients. And if you uh, go through the calculation, you can check that indeed uh, these expansion coefficients are nothing but the conformal generators of the, of the group acting on Hilbert space. So this is an operator identity. Which, express, which relates stress tensor to the uh, informal generators. So uh, are there any questions at this point? Because I'll try to, uh, yes. This uh, operator, uh, when you say they are the two mean that apply second time, they will come back. Yes, so it's. Uh, there is some questions about the normalization. Yeah. Yes, so um, indeed, there are, so there are interesting questions of, uh, th that you mentioned. In principle, if you look at the group, there are some relations, as you said, that if you some transformations, for example, L, uh, if you go back to this table, like for example, L has order two, so if you square it, you think should, it seems that you should get one. And uh, so there is indeed some non-trivial question of normalization, uh, but even more, so these relations, they are supposed only to hold if you, if you, if you work in the uh, SOD comma 2 without taking the universal cover. Uh, if you take the universal cover, and then in principle, I think what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to con continue integrating here. But I don't want to do that. I just want to integrate between one point and the next point. And then you can see that there is no way this can square to 1, because if I something which squares to 1 should, uh, after applying twice, should only depend on values at point x. But clearly, if I apply this transformation twice, I will depend on, everyth on everything between x and the point which is two steps ahead. But you can show that, um, you can show that uh, if you apply L twice, and in order to do that, you still you actually need to specify that the spin and dimension 
Lyrand principle series. Otherwise, the integrals will not converge in one of the transforms. And then you can see that the square is a, is a sum of delta functions at x, the next point, and the point next. So the algebra is a little bit modified in the way that we interpreted the relations. But, uh, and there is some interesting relation of the between them. So these relations do not literally hold between the, the group relations do not literally hold between the integral transforms. <coughs> okay, so before moving on to the next topic, I just want to point out this simple property of the slide transform L. And the property is that if we take any local operator for which the light transform converges and uh, act with light transform on the vacuum state, then we must get zero. And uh, the proof is relatively simple. We just look at any Weitman function where we have L of O acting on vacuum. And uh, we write out the definition of L of O. It contains some integral. Weitman functions have some analyticity properties. And we can use this analyticity properties to deform the integral into a complex plane and use some OP argument to bound the behavior of the Weitman function there and uh, drop the arcs at infinity and thus show that the, this transform is zero. You can explicitly check this, for example, on three-point functions because three-point functions in conformal field theory are completely fixed by conformal symmetry, so you can just take them, you can compute the integral and make sure that it is zero if you apply this to an operator acting in vacuum. If the operator doesn't act in vacuum, then light transform is in general non-zero in some interesting expression. And uh, for example, you can check that the algebra that we just discussed is, is uh, satisfied on, on, on three-point functions. <coughs> okay, so I just want to point this out. This will be needed in, in the following. And uh, now I want to move to the question of uh, analyticity and spin. So uh, <coughs> just a, as a reminder, the conformal partial wave expansion if you have, uh, let's for simplicity take a scalar four point function of identical scalars, then you can expand it in the uh, uh, conformal partial waves where you have some over spins, integral over some complex scaling dimension along principal series with perhaps some contour deformation that Gerhard was uh, referring to in uh, his talk on Wednesday, and times uh, some standard functions of uh, coordinates which. Uh, <coughs> Are the conformal partial waves and they're fixed by conformal symmetry and so on. And uh, in terms of the maybe more familiar to some conformal blocks, the conformal partial waves are sum of conformal block plus the shadow conformal block. And the relation between the conformal partial wave expansion and the V expansion comes from the fact that this coefficient function, C delta J, has poles in complex delta plane uh, at scaling dimensions of physical operators with the residues which are proportional to OP coefficients. And let me clarify the notation a little bit here. So for every integer j, there is a set of poles. And uh, I label this poles by index i. And the dependence of the poles on j is suggestive because I will now try to argue that there is a some sense in which uh, these poles join into analytic families between different j. <coughs> and so, uh, so this is a statement that singularities of this function at integer j are related to scaling dimensions and the OP coefficients of local operators. And, the relate, and then this means that we can deform this contour, pick up this pulse, and obtain the usual conform block expansion as a discrete sum. So the reason why this is interesting for us is that in uh, last year, Simon Kern Hood uh, derived a interesting formula for this function C delta J, which also Gerhard mentioned in his talk. Um, the form formula looks roughly as follows. So we a computing function C delta J, and it's proportional to this integral. So there is some uh, non-trivial normalization factor, which is a pro product of gamma functions, but it's explicitly known. And we're integrating over all points the uh, vacuum expectation value of this double commutator against a uh, particular conformal block and this conformal block has a funny feature that it has a scaling dimension. Instead of scaling dimension, it has j plus d minus 1. And instead of spin, it has delta minus d plus 1. So this is one of these reflections that we have just been discussing. So you can already see that there is some, some relation between this formula and, uh, and this 
tools that we, we introduced in the first part of the talk. And the tiled here means that the external dimensions for this conform block are the shadow dimensions of phi. And the meaning of this formula is that uh, if you plug in an integer number j into this formula, which is greater or equal to 2, then by construction you will recover the same c delta j as enters the conformal partial wave expansion. Uh, however, an interesting point is that this formula is analytic and converges for all j greater than 1. It may actually converge for a larger range of j, but it's guaranteed to converge in this region. And so it defines c delta j for some, uh, uh, as an analytic function for j not equal to integer values. And as we just discussed, the singularities of C delta J for integer J are related to local primary operators of integer spin. So the natural question is then, what is the meaning of the singularities for general complex spin, not necessarily integer? So the most naive guess would be that we have some, uh, yes, yeah, so in particular, this sort of simplest scenario of how this function looks like uh, that I want to keep in mind is that somehow this form continues to hold also for complex J so that the function C of delta J is meromorphic even for complex J and then there, is some, there are some families of poles which continue analytically between integer values. Now this statement is not obvious. It might be that for, for J equals 1.5, uh, 3, 7, 8, 9, this function is completely terrible, it has cuts and so on, but I don't know anything about the structure of this function. In perturbative examples, it seems to have meromorphic form, so for simplicity of discussion, I will just assume that all singularities are poles, even for complex J, and then we can discuss how the story is modified if this is not so. And so in this case, uh, this, this function delta I of J become analytic functions, and we have some trajectories of poles uh, and we, the most naive question that we can ask is whether there exist families of integer of operators Lj, which have non-integer spin and which at integer points reduce to local operators. And then we can interpret the, the singularities of this function C delta J as describing these continuous spin operators. So it turns out that this is not possible. And the reason is that as soon as we have a continuous non-integer spin operator, generically it must annihilate the vacuum state. And there are two arguments to show that. One argument is that if you, if you assume that the state is non-trivial, is not equal to zero, then connect on the state with our Casimir operators and we'll get some numbers. And as we change J, we will get one parameter family of Casimir eigenvalues. But on, on our physical Hilbert space, the Casimir, the Casimir operators have a discrete spectrum of eigenvalues and the one parameter family will generically never need them. So for generic J, it has to be that this vanishes. Another argument is that again, if you look at three point, tensor, <coughs> three point functions, even for continuous spin, they are fixed by conformal symmetry completely. And if we, are, if we live in a positive energy theory, we expect even the functions with uh, non-integer spin operators to satisfy the same analyticity properties as the usual Weidman functions. So we can check that these analyticity properties for these three-point functions and we can see that they fail. However, if the operator is inserted between two other local operators and this three-point function is completely well-defined and has the expected analyticity properties. So since we have concluded that for generic J, this operator is only the vacuum, if we want our families to be analytic, we must conclude that they annihilate the vacuum for all, for all J. This implies, in particular, that these operators must be non-local or equal to zero for any <coughs> spin J because any local operator which annihilates the vacuum by well-known theorems has to be equal to zero. And of course, this contradicts this naive suggestion that we have this family which reduces to local operators the integer spins. Uh, fortunately, we have our Knapstein intertwining operators, and there is an improved proposal that the, 
with our families, which are right now more precisely adding an index i which parameterizes the family, reduces not to local operators, but instead to light transforms of local operators for integer spins. And this doesn't contradict uh, these observations because light transform of a local operator is a non-local operator and we have established that it annihilates the vacuum state. Also notice that in this uh, proposal, J is not the spin of O anymore because light transform uh, sw swaps the dimension and spin. So J is one minus J is the dimension of this object, not the spin. <coughs> but it still will be generically uh, continuous non-integer spin because the, uh, its spin is one minus dimension of the local operator. And uh, so this is a proposal and we claim that it works. And for any proposal to work, it should work at least in three theories. So let's see what happens in three theories. And for simplicity, I'll focus on two dimensional case uh, and also a single scalar field, but this can also all be generalized to higher dimensions and other fields. So in, in two dimensions, in, if you use light cone coordinates U and V, uh, so these are not the usual cross ratios, these are the light cone coordinates. We have this, this family of lo local operators. We have normal order, ordered product of two phi's, <coughs> and we insert uh, J derivatives in U direction between them. And then we have to add some total derivative to make sure that this operator is transforms as a primary. So if you take uh, our L transform of this operator, and we, for simplicity, again, put it at pulse, pulse null infinity. This simply becomes the integral of this operator over du. This total derivative term drops out, and we have this simple expression. So now I have to construct for you a family of continuous spin operators, which uh, interpolates between these guys. And this turns out to be relatively easy to do. So we just define up to normalization, these continuous spin operators to be given by these expressions. Um, here we have roughly the same structure, but instead of derivatives, we have a new integration variable S. We have some kernel, which depends on J, and uh, we shift this operator, separate them by amount proportional to S. Now this expression looks like very it's not obvious why it has nice properties, but the claim is that you can check that with this definition, this operator transforms as primaries. You can write an expression which is covariant and valid for all uh, coordinates of this operator, not just at plus null infinity, just that this expression is going to be uh, unnecessarily complicated and uh, will hide the structure. Now, it's easy to check that this reduces to this expression for even spin j, because for even spin j, this uh, kernel here is a node function of S, whereas this uh, transform here is uh, an even function of S because the operators commute. And this would seem to imply that this integral vanishes, but because of the singularity at S equals zero in the epsilon prescription, it turns out that the contribution is proportional to the derivative of delta function. Then if we replace this kernel by derivative of a delta function, we reproduce this operator. And so this indeed implies that if we choose normalization factors appropriately, we have the required property. And so I should make two comments about this. One comment is that this, of course, we did not invent. This, uh, such and similar operators have been uh, constructed by people who do gauge theory, perturbation theory, and so on. Uh, and this is a relatively well-known expression. It's just that here we are trying to interpret this in a more general conformational theory context. Another comment is that uh, there is a restriction that spin is even integer, and this comes from the fact that, uh, which I neglected in the previous discussion, that you should be careful and you should be analytically continuing from, you should have two analytic families, one for even spin j and one for odd spin j. The reason for that is that there is a quantum number which is related to CPT symmetry, which distinguishes even spin and odd spin operators from um, <coughs> even spin and odd spin local operators from each other by eigenvalue, which is either plus or minus one. As, and as you continue, this eigenvalue has to stay plus one, minus one. So this restricts the, this intersection with integer spin operators to only even or odd integers. So if you take there are no odd spin operators here, 
it's not a little bit not obvious, but there are no OTP and primary operators uh, in this case, so this is the only answer. If you take phi one and phi two to be different scalars, then you can write a similar formula, which is valid for odd spin, <coughs> for odd spin trajectory. Now the question is that, so I showed you this example in, uh, in free theory, and the question is whether we can define these operators in, in general interacting CFT. And so we have a proposal for how to do that. And the idea is that we can define local operators by taking their OP. And uh, <coughs> it is known, in principle, that we expect some non-integer spin operators to appear in OP of uh, operator product expansion of local operators, which is continued to some uh, interesting regimes, like regular regime. So the way we therefore phrase our construction is that we also take the OP of two local operators, in this case, two scalars. But instead of bringing them close to each other, we integrate them with some kernel k, which is determined by conformal symmetry and uh, some additional considerations. I don't have to ex explain the construction, but the idea is that uh, we define the, these operators O delta j by this integral, and here k should depend on delta and j as well. And the, this interpolating families are defined to be the residues of this object O delta j. And the construction here is chosen such that it, it's guaranteed for integer spin that these guys are reduced to light transforms of uh, local operators. So we just choose this kernel so that this property that we want holds. And it turns out that this kernel is indeed an analytic function in J. And so we can expect that this, th this kind of identity is also hold, hold at non-integer J. And if you apply this construction to the free field case, free field theory, you recover this precisely these operators. Uh, I started this discussion from the Lorentz inversion formula of current hood, and it turns out that this, this proposal naturally leads to the inversion formula, because we now can take this object, which generates all the uh, non-integer spin operators, and you can start computing its matrix elements. So its matrix elements, by definition, are related to some integrals of four-point functions. And but since it transforms as a primary operator, these matrix elements are bound to be proportional to some standard <coughs> three-point functions. And the proportionality coefficient, if we call it C delta J, and we, inter we ask what this formula means for this function C delta J, it turns out that C delta J is given precisely by the Lorentz inversion formula of current hood. So this is the connection from our story to this formula. And moreover, our story gives a very simple derivation of uh, variance inversion formula. In particular, it gives a very natural expression for it. Before I have written down this integral, uh, I'm eating some gamma functions and so on, and it also was not clear where this funny block comes in, where the, the dimension and spin were switched. But uh, using this technology, you can write down this following formula, which involve, inclu already includes all the normalization factors, which just turn out to be 1 over 2 pi. And let me just decipher it a little bit. We again do the integral over all the positions of double commutator, vacuum spatial value of double commutator times this object. And this object is just the compact notation for a conformal block. What the, this notation means is that, first of all, we have here two three-point functions, so I will explain what this three-point function means, but this is one three-point function, another three-point function, and there is a two-point function in denominator. And this notation just means take this two three-point function and glue them, using, glue them together using the two-point function. And then I need to explain what this three-point functions are. So this three-point function, it, it starts with phi phi O, so this is just a standard three-point function that we use for uh, scalar, scalar, spin, J operator. Then we apply the light transform to it. So we just compute the integral, we get some new three-point function. And then finally we apply this minus one, which just means that we take the dual of the stru structure with respect to some naturally defined pairing. And the same holds for the second three-point function and, the, and for the two-point function of the denominator. 
And what this means is that all this, uh, the entire Lorentz inversion formula can be written down in terms of simple natural operations with, re with respect to Lorentz and conformal group, such as this light transforms and uh, dual pairings. And the advantage of this expression is that it's straightforward to generalize it to any spin. Uh, you can just replace phi, so these operators with spin, and it, the same formula holds. And the two pi remains two pi. Whereas if you go to Fern Hertz form paper or later paper by uh, Witten, Simmons, Duffin, and Stanford, you will find derivations which are completely non obvious how to generalize to spinning four point functions. Okay, so do I have 10 more minutes or? Okay, so are there any questions about this so that I can go on to next? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this formula is compatible with this. No, so th this, this formula is compatible with this because what will happen is that in that case, C should have two indices, which describes the tensor structure for one, for left part of the confirmed partial wave and tensor structure for the right part because there are two three point function structures which you need to glue together to get the confirmed partial wave. And similarly here, you have two three point structures that you have to start with. So the synthesis will also be here. So you choose which three point structures you put in this formula. So yes, in general case, there will be two more indices here and indices also on this three point tensor structures. And then it will be correct formula. I, I also had a question. So th does this new derivation of the formula shed some light on the analytic structure of this function C delta J that? No. So it's, uh, the derivation goes as follows. We start with the Euclidean version of this inversion formula and then we do some manipulations. Uh, we arrive, and Euclidean version is of course only valid for integer spin. We arrive at this expression, and then we observe that it's an this expression is analytic in spin. So it, it, it's not giving new information from this point of view. Okay, so uh, I just want to then mention a brief application of this. So the most famous application of uh, analyticity of this function C delta J of spin is of course conformal rigid theory where you do Zomerfeld Watson resummation, you deform some, uh, you turn sum of over J into integral over J, and then you pick up some uh, post and complex J plane, and you get uh, this uh, nice story, which we can then interpret using our proposal as a contribution of certain non-local, non-integer spin operators to the four point function. But instead I'll, I want to focus on a different problem here the operator product expansion of energy detectors. And what I mean by that is uh, essentially this formula. So we, the way to interpret this is that, first of all, we have vacuum state in which we act with some local operator, uh, which we have Fourier transformed in Fourier space. So this part is some state. Then on the left, we have just Hermitian conjugate of this state. And in between, so essentially we are computing expectation value in some state, and the object that we are computing expectation value of is given by this expression. So this is two light transforms of stress tensor, and they're inserted at the same point at spatial infinity. So I cannot draw this on the blackboard, because this will require an extra di direction, but both light transform are integrated, both stress tensors are integrated over the future null infinity, but they do so in different directions. So if you focus on the neighborhood of uh, spatial infinity, then we have the point at infinity, we have two polarization vectors Z1 and Z2, and the integration contours for the two average null energy operators go off in two different directions. And what we want to study is how this behaves as these two directions come together. This has the interpretation that you have some state uh, you have the state and then you, so you prepare it somehow and then you put the de energy detectors in some directions and you just measure all the energy which flies in these directions. And then you ask what is the correlation function of this energy detectors. So it's convenient to parameterize 
this null polarization in the following form, we set the time component to be one and the spatial components to be given by some unit vectors and one and then two. And then this is a function of these two unit vectors and one and then two. Uh, the vectors in the scene vectors live on celestial sphere. And uh, so we want to study the behavior as uh, and one goes to and two. So in principle, this operator O can also have some indices, but for simplicity, you can imagine that this is a scalar, so this is a scalar function. And so what we would like to do is to have some kind of OP decomposition, but we don't know how to do that because these operators aren't acting on the vacuum and uh, as Gerhard has taught us, the, confirm the P expansion converges for operators acting on the vacuum, but if they do not act on the vacuum, we don't know what to do. So, but we can always use the confirm partial wave expansion. It's just some function of two, polar, of two positions. We can apply the confirm partial wave expansion to and expand it in, with respect to the Lorentz group now in this integral where we have some new kind of small dimension. We don't have any spin, we just have this function C tilde of delta uh, and some new analogs of conformal partial waves. And this conformal partial waves are actually related to this uh, defect conformal partial waves that Volker was talking about in his talk, <coughs> was mentioning in his talk. And then to correspond to this expansion formula, there is an inversion formula which, which takes us in the opposite direction, which says that uh, uh, we can compute this function C of delta by taking our function f n1 and 2 and integrating it with some complex conjugate, with some conjugate function. And so what we can do is we can just apply this inversion formula to this expression and what we will end up with is some integral of a, some integral of a four point function so we'll have four point function of O, T, T, O integrated with some kernel. And moreover, we can see from this expression that what we will get is a double commutator because light transforms, as I mentioned, annihilate the vacuum. So we can replace this part by a commutator and we can replace this part by a commutator. So the formula which computes for us the C dot, C tilde of delta therefore has to be uh, has to have the same schematic form as the Lorentz inversion formula. It's an integral of a double commutator against something. And in fact, if we just look at this, uh, stare at this expression, we will realize that it's precisely the Lorentz inversion formula, just evaluated at particular value of spin and particular value of scaling dimension. So this function C tilde of delta, which appears in this expression, turns out to be the same as the function of, as the function which com is computed by Lorentz inversion formula and which appears in the usual conformal, par conformal partial wave expansion. <coughs> so using this identity and the expansion of our observable in this integral, you can then use the usual argument and deform the contour to pick up the poles, which we are now know to be given by, uh, which we in principle know to be given by local operators for integer spin. But this is one of the situations when the function that you need to use here is actually an analytic continuation from even spin. So from this point of view, j equals three is not actually the integer spin value. It's rather a non, it's a wrong integer spin value similar to what I discussed as a scalar example. So in this case, we expect this to be uh, false of this function, so singularities in this function more generally to be related to this non-integer spin operators that we have constructed. And then this identity, if you interpret this in terms of, uh, in operator sense, is equivalent to this expansion where you have product of two average orange operators and you expand them in the sum over um, particular spin three non-local operators. And I want to stress that this expansion is completely quantitative. You can, uh, it's not some schematic <coughs> idea all, this, all the coefficients are completely computable if you know the function C delta J. And for example, if you, we have studied the N equals four superior mules, where the correlation function of stress tensors can be related to correlation function of scalars and uh, by some using supersymmetry. And then there are some known results in perturbation theory about function C delta J. We can 
use the node continuation then and obtain this expansion for uh, obtain this expansion and match it to the Nolan expressions for the energy correlators correlation functions and n equals four. Okay, so just to summarize, the point that I was trying to convey in my talk is that you can use the <coughs> is that the tools of harmonic analysis and Lorenzian group and Lorenzian conformal group seem to be essential for understanding this uh, question of an LTC and spin. And uh, thanks to these tools, we are able to find some what we think is the plausible story for uh, operator version of this analyticity of partial waves and spin. And uh, these proposed non-integer spin operators, they control interesting behavior of the CFTs in regimes such as the OP OPJ limit or OP of certain non-local operators. And there are, of course, some questions. So the question what Vyacheslav asked is, what is the general analytic structure of this function C delta J for an integer spin? Is it meromorphic? Are there cuts? Uh, what is the, if, they're on, if it's meromorphic, what is the structure of the spin trajectories? Is, do, they form, uh, do they form a single function or there are several sev functions which uh, describe these trajectories? And the related question is whether this construction that we proposed is indeed well defined for general CFT. And I guess the more practical question that I'm interested in is whether we can check this, all this theory, rigid theory, this OP, and so on in some non precognitive CFT, like say three dimensionalizing model numerically. So that's all. So thank you for your attention. So I, I have a question. Uh, you have the OPE for this uh, stress tensor light, uh, light ray operators on the celestial sphere energy correlation. Can you imagine some sort of crossing on, on the celestial sphere? Well, it's, you mean like imagining four point functions? And yeah, something like that. Uh, maybe yeah, that. maybe, but it's from the point of view of usual correlation functions, this would be six-point functions because you always have to have the state in which you're evaluating things. So it's, it's, it's not obvious whether there is something interesting. But maybe maybe there is some subsector of six-point crossing equation which is captured by, by, by this. I have a que question about the second part of your talk about this. Uh, uh, energy energy correlations, what you're talking about, small angle limit. Yes. So this issue has been studied a uh, long time ago in context of QCD and more or less we know what we expect to find. Uh -huh. But my question is slightly different. That what this analysis has shown is that uh, this behavior, small angle behavior of this quantity is controlled by what people call time-like anomalous dimension. And those anomalous dimensions have a feature that are not related to anomalous dimension of local operators. In other words, they don't appear in any local OP. Whereas from your analysis, if I understood correctly, if you all follow the logic, you will get finally to the expression that will move scaling dimension, normal dimension of the operator, which will appear in the OP. Well, they, th these operators do not appear in local OP, so these are analytic continuation of True, the but what it will be continuing, it will be continuing anomalous dimension of local operator in spin. And what I'm telling you is that what based on what people did before, those anomalous dimensions will be in the final formula. They're not related to any continuation of local operators. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the statement, so it would be nice if I can talk to you about this. Uh, how does uh, how uh, I formula sensitive your formula is sensitive to unitarity if you consider non unitary theories uh, many things will change which formula no, I mean uh, for example inversion formula and so in principle inversion formula is just kinematics uh, mm -hmm. but some things require unitarity so for example here when I say that um, that th this uh, in this integral converges for j greater than one. This assumes some uh, 
some boundedness of the four-point function regi limit, and that requires uh, uh, that requires unitarity to bound to prove this bound. So if if the function is reasonably well behaved, then probably unitarity is not essential because this is in a sense just a kinematical statement. If you can apply Euclidean partial wave expansion and the function is sufficiently well behaved, this should work even in a unitary theory. Uh, we have uh, at least one example of explicit and non-perturbative uh, four-point function in fishnet theory, which we yes, recently that's found. Large could, you, could you just insert it there and check? Uh, uh, yeah, but yes, I, th I think this should be possible. But this is also large n still. Ah, wh what is bad about large n? In it's still kind of a perturbation, a perturbative expansion. Huh? It still is, in some sense, a perturbative expansion. I mean, as far as the properties of this function C delta j goes, I can even ask this in the planar n equals 4, and it's, we know what, that it's uh, meromorphic, and we know this people have computed to large precision where it's, uh, what is the trajectory, but the question is what happens to this at finite n. But yes, I, I think it should be interesting to apply this to fishnet theory as well. But I mean, I mean, I mean the C delta J is known for fishnet theory, right? That's the, what have been computed, and uh, so in a sense, it's, it's we already know the answer, right? And in that case, it's meromorphic, and there are two trajectories or something, and they form a single Riemann, Riemann surface. Maybe I missed something. Uh, maybe I missed something. So this formula cannot be uh, is valid only for the principal series. So it converges on principal series, and then you have to analytically continue away from that. Ah, so you can it can be analytically continued. Well, that's just the C delta J. Uh -huh. So. Uh, yeah, the C delta J. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. Same. Well, let's uh, let's thank Peter again.